I'm Ryan, this is 52 SC Friday. This week it's time to find out how did the ugly stage go? Were any of the approaches to biome cycling better than others? What pieces of gear under or outperformed expectations? And some missteps along the way. These tanks are the application of everything that we've learned in 20 years of reefing. Is it going as expected? All that is coming up. We started this series with a belief that scaling or pairing our approach to biome cycling to the difficulty of the tank style that we're attempting will produce consistently better results and save resources when we can. All of them with various approaches to introducing microbiome to sea, microcrustacean, bacteria, and archaea. Seven out of seven tanks would seem to confirm that biome cycling correctly did set these tanks up for success and consistently avoided the challenges that plague many new tanks. However, sometimes there's too much of a good thing, and once you understand what influences the outcome, you can tweak this knowledge intuitively to create your own recipes for success specific to your tank desires. There's also one thing that you're gonna learn about this series today. For the first time, we deviate from the laws of great video production and focus on the laws of great marine tank production. Meaning that we're not focusing on the speed to outcome, which is entertaining, but rather the quality of outcome, which is what most of you and future reefers to come are after. Time to start that off with one of the most popular tank styles out there right now, the Nano Tank. Kicking it off with a Nano, it's a lower par tank where we want an easy open aquascape using that Real Reef Nano Kit in purple color that looks good and hides all those uglies. The biome cycle consisted of ocean direct sand mixed with a couple pounds of Tampa Bay saltwater sand from the ocean, some TBS rubble in the back chamber, galaxy pods, and ambient light for a month or so. Then we turned the lights on and added some one and only when we added the fish. Net result, when the lights came on, some brown slime developed, turned the lights off for a week, tried again, and only 20% came back, implemented those scheduled water changes, and it was gone for good. Tank looks great now, showing signs of calcareous algae seeded from the TBS sand and rubble and ready for corals. The approach of pods, bacteria, populated sand, and that seeded biome from the oceans with its natural from TBS media combined with that light reset worked well in a dry rock tank. Now this is a lower light tank, which is easier to biome cycle. What about a higher light tank like the Magnifica Harem? In contrast to the Nano, the Magnifica Anemone tank is also a dry rock tank, but also much higher par, like three to four times as much light energy fueling both corals and pest organisms. With this tank, we had a desire for a specific style ridge aquascape that the AF dry rock achieved well. If using dry rock meant a bit longer cycle, we were okay with that, but it turns out that it wasn't necessary. Because this tank is a high par tank that's more likely to grow uglies and the Magnifica does better in an established stable tank, we took a more deliberate approach to biome with 100% of the sand from TBS and recently collected out of the Gulf of Mexico. Galaxy pods and then some one and only when we added fish. Ambient light for a month or so and then turn the lights on. Result of this approach is when the lights came on, brown slime showed up. However, it was minimal diatom bloom, so we left the lights on and it just resolved itself over a couple of weeks. Algae did start to slowly grow, likely seeded from the sand, but it didn't take off because the rock wasn't established with algae. We added a couple of tanks, snails, crabs, and the algae was done. Tank is growing coralline on the rock, pumps, and starting on the back. It seems stable. For me, this was the desired outcome. I get to use a dry rock that I enjoy working with, but without the dry rock biome challenges. I also seemed like a path to a visually biome stable high par tank in a reasonable period of time. I believe it's now ready to introduce our Magnifica and the clown shortly after. This might end up being a controversial statement, but I believe that one of the lessons that we're learning here is the right sand is maybe more important than the right rock. If you get the right sand, you can probably use any popular rock. Conversely, if you use the wrong sand, the importance of the rocks goes up. If you use no sand, then that rock needs to be ultra established or you're in for a very long, hard road. What most reefers miss is in an average tank, there's about as many pounds of sand as rock. However, sand's small particle size has many more times the surface area than the rock, likely even if you only consider what's exposed at the top. Sand is also where the organics settle out and feed much of the microbiome. Microorganisms live where the food is. The surface of the sand or media is also a natural surface for them to populate on rather than artificial or mined surfaces. The nature of how the sand turns over also means it has fewer photosynthetics populating its surface than the rock. For perspective, I'd say that there are four basic styles of sand that you can match to your needs. You'll see us use three of them today, match that mentality. Ultra live sand collected from the ocean, shipped in water like TBS. Retail live sand, which is cleaner, more consistent size, stored moist with the bacteria of the sea like Ocean Direct. Pseudo live sand, which has been dried, sifted, sized, and then repacked in water containing bacteria. And then just dry sand, which is obviously not material live. 
In the next tank, we matched ultralife sand with ultralife rock, which had a different result. With the SPS collector's tank, the biome cycle considered the fact that this is also a much higher tank. SPS corals thrive in established tanks and grow or calcify in established rock better. For that reason, the biome was seeded with the TBS package from Tampa Bay Saltwater, which is a mix of mined and artificial rock that's dropped in the ocean and cultured or farmed until the ocean populates it naturally. The rock collected and shipped airport to airport in bags of water, coupled with their sand and a cleanup crew. We added some galaxy pods, which was arguably not necessary with rock like this, but we had them here and used them, so it's worth noting. Lastly, some one and only when we added the fish, likely also unnecessary with an approach like this, but when something works, stick to it. Ambient light for a month or so, and then we turn the lights on. Net result? This tank rapidly grew a wide variety of algae on the rock, and you had to turn the lights off for a week. Just the nature of being wild, having wild algae established on its surface, some organic decay and related nutrients feeding the algae, coupled with very high PAR. However, we added a couple of herbivorous fish, turned the lights back on, and we were off to the races without an issue. Still a few patches of random algae, but nothing invasive. I will note that most people who buy the TBS package with premium rock in it are buying it for the type of diverse life you can see with the naked eye. We're using it for the diverse microscopic life you can't see. The 30 days or so of only ambient light will reduce or stunt the photosynthetic forms of life on the rock and what you can see with the eye, but in that case, that was our desired outcome. We wanted to stunt the photosynthetic uglies in a high par tank like this one. One other note on the TBS sand, it's a chunkier, larger sand that doesn't blow around as easy, which is great for a high flow SPS tank and looks similar to many natural, shallow, high energy reefs that you'd see diving or snorkeling. The larger chunks are the natural collection of small pieces of coral, shells, and other calcifying organisms building up in these active reefs. In the tank, the chunks stay put, and because it's not pristine white, hide some of the inevitable uglies. I'm becoming a bit of a convert and now appreciate the approach of this natural looking rubble shell look of a high energy reef as much as the dune type of small grain sand that many deeper LPS lower energy reefs have. The only change I'd make to this approach is having the herbivorous fish in before the lights come on. Coralline algae is rapidly spreading throughout the tank now, by far the fastest of any tank in this series and amongst the fastest of any tank I've ever done. I believe a combination of the livest source of biome combined with the best flow and biology is producing that. The tank seems ready to support SPS corals and the test frames will go in soon. Next is the softy tank where we take a totally different approach. The softy tank actually goes back the other direction to a low to medium par tank where we used an NSA dry rock aquascape and a similar approach to the nano. 90% of the sand's ocean direct, just a few pounds of TBS sand for additional seeding, additional galaxy pods and Dr. Tim's when the fish went in. The lower par tank should be easier, and in this case we didn't experience any noticeable slimes, but the white rock did develop a green tint with film algae, which eventually dissipated. The green tint is very common in white dry rock like this, but no one wants to see it. Not necessarily because it grows more algae, but because white surfaces shows algae much more than purple or dark surfaces. More or less, this is the same green film that grows on the glass, it just isn't as easy to clean. So what caused that green tint to largely go away is the question. There are some possible contributors. The first is too much light. We made a misstep with the Kessels on this tank, and then when we corrected it, it went away. Something that we'll share more details on later on this video. However, most things in reefing are actually caused or solved by multiple things, and we misinterpret just one of them as the cause or solution. In this case, it was about the same time that we turned on the UV and ozone as well, both of which can impact the proliferation of algae slimes in a variety of ways. I don't think the ozone or UV was the entire solution, but combined with fixing that light issue, it might be the collective solution to a common problem. That brings up the question of when is it the right time to turn the UV and ozone on, day one, day 60, when you run into problems? And when did we do it on these tanks? There's no universally accepted correct answer. My experience suggests that the right answer for me is after the tank's microbiome has visually stabilized. When is that? In our case, two to three months in, after a month or so of no light, a month or so of light on, and when things appear to be going well. The reason is for me, even though UV will help prevent or fight some pests, the UV is primarily there to protect the fish, not fight pests. Because these tanks are stocked with proactively treated fish from marine collectors, fish parasites are not a big concern up front. If we stocked with untreated fish, I think I'd extend that dark period a couple of weeks, add the fish and turn the lights and the UV on simultaneously. 
It might slow the proliferation of microbiome to a small degree, but because most of the desirable organisms we're concerned about populate and spread over surfaces and not the water column, UV is not likely to have a material impact at that point. The ozone is different. Even though ozone and oxidants will help prevent or fight some pests, the primary reason we use ozone is just to keep the water crystal clear for a pristine display and eliminate the need for carbon. Another difference is while the mechanism for ozone that creates crystal clear water is well understood, how it prevents, slows, or eliminates pest organisms is not as well understood, particularly in the comparatively smaller amounts of ozone that we use in these tanks. Ozone could directly affect these microscopic organisms' life cycle, but just as likely could oxidize nutrient sources that these pests feed on, and the cleaner water just prevents their proliferation. With a new tank full of unknowns, it just makes sense for us to let that play out and stabilize before introducing another new thing. Ozone is extremely common in zoos and commercial aquaculture and advanced reef tanks for decades, but it's an area where the absence of absolute knowledge is replaced with experience, readily testing recipes and methods at work and putting those concepts up for peer testing review. Peers being all of you, other reefers, that's what these seven tanks in 52 SE are all about. Applied knowledge, observation, and confirmation of repeatable results. And that brings us to the Chromis tank. This tank is near identical to the SPS tank, but subtle changes that produce a different, now predictable result. The heart of the Chromis habitat is effectively fast growing SPS corals for the Chromis to live in. The approach with the Chromis in the SPS tank was near identical. Only difference was rather than use TBS package that includes their premium rock with lots of visual life, we use their base rock, which doesn't have as much visual life on it, but comes at a significantly lower cost. Because we cured it in a tank with only ambient light for a month or so, base rock is probably a better choice for our approach. Lack of light is not good for the premium rock. The photosynthetics that don't make it on the premium rock in the ambient light only serve as decaying fuel for pests. Other than that, same TBS sand, Galaxy Pods, and Dr. Tim's one and only. Result, when we turned the lights on, it exploded in LG, but not meaningful slimes. We added an orange shoulder and a naso tang on a Friday, and by Monday, the tank was free of LG and looks great since. Same temporary brown diatom bloom that lasted a week or so and then just resolved itself. For me, the TBS base rock and sand was the right mix of what I was looking for at a lower cost and what I would do next time on a tank like this one filled with SPS. One of the things I learned from this tank and the SPS tank relates back to our biome experiments as well. In the biome series, we found that the Florida cultured rock experienced one of the more challenging starts, but also ended in arguably the best place. I'd certainly argue that this tank and the SPS tank that use wet, live, established rock are in the best position right now. If we had not added utilitarian fish or performed a light reset to these high energy par tanks, they also would have had an ugly start. That poses the differences between a live tank and an experiment tank. In experiments, we avoid variables like cleanup crews, utilitarian fish, and lighting resets because something as small as a fish's taste for a certain algae can influence the outcome of an experiment. The goal is to learn something new, then add variables into the next experiment and continue learning with each round of revision. In this case of the Biome 1 experiment, the important lesson may not have been where the ocean cultured rock started but where it ended. We haven't started the Biome 2 experiment yet just due to available time, but in reality, you can consider all seven tanks in the 52XE the application of the most critical lessons we learned from those experiments and the pursuit of replicable paths to high percentage success that factor in the nuance of different goals and environmental influences like strength of light or media is used. In this case, the coralline algae is doing well populating the tank. We even added clams from clam mania. They're doing well, and it's time to start populating with corals. But what about the predator tank? This is a tank where we use the most dry, sterile material and arguably the weakest approach to biome. The Predator tank was something entirely different. This is a very low light tank that shouldn't run into many of the issues a typical reef tank runs into. In this case, no truly live sand. We use Carib Sea black sand for visual effect. We also use Carib Sea's dry rock. However, we did mix in a few pounds of TBS sand and put about 10 pounds of TBS rubble in the sump area. Galaxy Pods and Dr. Tim's when we added the fish. Result is the only place we experienced any notable pests was directly under the lights. We used Kessel's reflectors to create a cool visual look in the tank that highlights certain areas of the habitat design, creates contrast, sense of depth, and something that I'm very happy with. However, that focus light did grow some algae at first. The contrast versus the areas that are not lit as well were noticeable for a couple of weeks, however, evened out over time. 
Overall, we received a healthy amount of feedback that there was more effort put into the overall design than most people would put into a typical fish-only tank like this one. However, I'm okay with that. We're building what I believe is a visually impressive display that highlights and respects the animals and avoids many issues that are common in marine aquaria. Next time you see this tank, the dragon eel will likely be introduced. Before we get to some of the biggest equipment challenges and surprise wins, we also have the LPS tank, which is similar to the softy tank parameters, but we also had some predictable differences. The LPS collector's tank is a low to medium light tank that used dry Marco rock, ocean direct sand, a few pounds of TBS sand, some TBS rubble in the sump, galaxy pods, and the one and only when we added the fish. Ambient light for a month, and then the lights came on. Only difference here is the three tangs were in the tank well before the lights came on and likely part of why we never ran into any algae or maybe why we didn't even run into the green film algae for more than a week or two and it just resolved itself. Not even diatoms in this case. We've added some test corals in this tank and it seems to be ready for stocking. Different than the Marco rock in the softy tank, this rock is taking on more of an organic gray. There are clear signs of coralline and it will populate the rock eventually. One thing that's worked out well in this peninsula is the dual sided ridge wall aquascape. It's going to be perfect to display many corals and viewing angles as possible. The opposing gyres in the back are working as designed, providing alternated currents in the tank, which seems ideal for this type of tank. However, not everything has been roses. It wouldn't be a reef tank if we didn't run into some hiccups, mistakes, or unexpected events. We did experience some unexpected challenges and some wins along the way as well, first of which wasn't really an issue for us because we spread what we got over multiple tanks, but there is a cost with getting that starter biome from TBS. The minimum sand rubble you can get is 20 pounds each. Rubble isn't cheap because it's not leftover pieces, but hand collected small pieces. TBS's method of shipping is airport cargo and bags of water, so a little bit more effort goes into that. I believe it to be one of the best available options, but it isn't the cheapest. It would be awesome if they made a small starter kit for dry rock users that was UPSable. My guess is that might become the go-to kit for a nation full of reefers. Another challenge we ran into gets to the fact that nothing is perfect and everything has its upsides and downsides. The TBS Premium Rock comes with a tremendous amount of life on it. Because it's fresh, collected, and shipped airport to airport in bags of water, it's like nothing that you've ever seen before. However, it's not all good. It comes with what's in the ocean. In our case, we added three small stripies and three small purple tanks and quickly saw them getting picked off one by one. This is an open scape, so if they had just died, we would have likely found the remains. Could be a mantis shrimp, could be a gorilla crab, but in this case, we actually believe it to be the multiple octopus we found during scaping. Frankly, that's the first time in 20 years of reefing that I've run into hitchhiking octopus. Didn't know any better and just thought they were cool, so we threw them back in the tank. Wouldn't do that again. Instead, we just swapped out the smaller fish for larger herbivorous fish without issue. Next time, I think I would have actually rapidly set up a nano just for these cool octopus and attempted to care for them. I bet some people won't be surprised to hear this challenge, but the grouper that we added is posing serious challenges. Apollo is by far the coolest fish that's ever entered the building. But man, is he aggressive. Not just with the fish that can fit into his mouth, but also those that clearly can't. More or less just trying to bite him in half. We feed him silver sides and he more or less jumps out of the tank to get them. We had to remove the naso and ord shoulder tang that was in there because he was aggressive. That means two things. We'll need to find the right inverts to keep the algae at bay or get some really big tanks. Two more obvious concern is will he eat the chromis when we add them? The answer to that is depending on how well we do our job and how much habitat they have, he will likely catch a few as an alternative to the silver sides. But if it becomes more than just a few, it's time for a tank shuffle with the grouper going to the predator tank. After all, this isn't the grouper SPS tank, it's the chromis school tank. We're going to find out if it can be done successfully, learn from both the successes and the mistakes. Reality is Apollo eats fish in the wild and he needs that to survive. Fish like silver sides and chromis are just natural food types for him. Not a challenge per se, but you might have noticed that we had planned on using Brightwell's Microbacter 7 but didn't. The reason is simple. With the level of effort that we put into natural sources of bacteria, we just didn't feel the need in the end. However, if we didn't use those sources like TBS sand or rubble, we absolutely would have used Microbacter 7 and followed the directions to a T. There are other options out there from Dr. Tim's and KZ. The Microbacter 7 just happens to be the one that most of the people that I trust use and happens to be one of the most affordable as well. If truly live options are not on the table, these bacteria in a bottle are what I would use to establish biome over just the crapshoot gamble of a sterile tank.
You might have noticed that both the NSAs using Marco rocks were purple, but now white or dark gray. That's the nature of being a trailblazer and trying things first. I heard about the solution that makes Marco rock purple, and they sent me some to try. In testing, we'd find out that it needs a UV protectant, and without that, the purple turns back to white. Our lighting solution mimics the tropics at about 15 feet deep and has a lot more high energy violet light than most installs, so it happened here fast and turned white. Good news is they adapted and reformulated right away and their purple rock no longer does that. I personally much prefer purple over white simply because white shows every ugly so much more distinctly. Another challenge we ran into was related to that green film on the softy tank, just another instance where humans make human mistakes. The Kessels got left on 24 seven for three weeks and likely the primary culprit that fueled that green film. On October 23rd, we pulled the Kessel Spectral Controller to make manual adjustments for shooting video. When we were done, we simply forgot to plug it back in, which left them permanently on. We didn't notice because we leave at 5 p.m. and the lights turn off at 6. We identified the issue during our first Black Friday shoot on November 17th at 7 p.m. when we all said, why is the tank still on? Solution in this case was a few fold. First, change the timing so they're off at 4 p.m. so we know that it's good when we leave. Set up the redundancy on the apex to turn the lights off at 4 p.m. regardless of the light's internal controller. Set up toggle switches to turn the blades and the kessels off independently. And power usage alarms for if the opposite ever happens and we forget them off. In this ideal world, probably something that we should have set up day one. But in real world, we're consistently finding new ways to add redundancy and protect the tank from avoidable and unavoidable challenges. If there's only one thing that I've taken away from reviewing the progress and the experience so far, it's that the ugly stage is likely to happen to some degree in nearly all new tanks, but it can be a week-long bump in the road, or it can be much worse. How long and how bad it is likely tied to the balance between the amount of light energy and the effort put into establishing a microbiome and correctly applied lessons. One step further, for those of us that have been around for a long time, there's no question that the last 10 years has produced a lot more issues with slimes, dinos, diatoms, and other tank plagues than the 10 years before it. All these experiences seem to suggest to me that that's a direct result of two things. A one-two punch of going sterile and high par at the same time. First, the ban on live rock collection in many countries happened about seven to eight years ago. Combined with a simultaneous skill set and technology evolution, where over the last decade, high par reefing went from something just a very few percent of reefers did to something almost anyone can do who watches just a few how-to videos to do it. For instance, back in 2015 with the original 52 Weeks, much of the conversation in the community was still centered around things like learning the basics of science of calcification, carbon and GFO, how a refugium works, what a skimmer is, and how to tune it, and so on. That rapid evolution of skill sets had people trying harder high par tanks at the exact moment when the most commonly used supply of wet live rock disappeared from the hobby. There's no way of knowing for sure. But my best educated guess is it's that combo that's the cause of a decade's worth of ugly stages and challenges. The best way to know is to see what the community does with today's knowledge and how it affects the next 10 years. Addressing these considerations certainly seems to be the solution for us, and we can continue using some of the new zero or near zero ocean impact dry rock solutions. Next week, we get to our first science episode, Poisons and Pollution, the Silent Killer, Filtration and Dilution, the Solution, that and the entire 52SE playlist right here.